Good morning to Open Heaven Church, Wensbury, and we give you all a warm welcome to our Sunday services and we pray that you will enjoy them. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Lord, this is the day that you alone have made. Let us join together and rejoice in praise, worship and thanksgiving and your love, giving you all the honour and glory. Bless everything that is said today. Bless everyone who watches in and listens to this uh, video. Lord, we pray this that for the extension of your glorious kingdom and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah.
So good morning and welcome to this morning's talk. We're going to follow on from last week's talk where we spoke about justice and injustice and we're going to move into now a series looking at the Beatitudes and this is where Jesus did, started his Sermon on the Mount. He'd already called his disciples, he began his teaching and he was proclaiming and telling everybody about the coming of the kingdom of God. And he'd also been walking around healing people. But now he was going to start teaching people about what were the important characteristics of people. How should we be acting? What should our ethics be? What template should we have? What should we use when making decisions as to whether something is right, something is wrong, how we should act? And what decisions should we be making if we want to be righteous people and follow Christ and gain that entrance into, into heaven? So let's have a think about who his audience was. Well, his audience was made up of different people. There were his disciples who had already been called. And it was important that Jesus gave this message to his disciples so they knew the type of people that they should be. But it was also the general population. You know, these are not called people. These were just Jews. And they had not yet been called. So he had to give a message to them as well. But in a way that they could understand that message without having been given the preamble and the teachings and the experience that his disciples had. So... The Sermon of the Mount, as I mentioned, begins with the Beatitudes, and these are all about our character. What character qualities should we have? And how do we obtain those qualities comes later. So what he's saying in the Beatitudes, uh, this is who you should be. He's not talking about how we get to be that person. That he teaches later on in the Sermon on the Mount, and in other teachings that he gives. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, the first few verses. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be confronted, comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will show, be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And then he concludes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. So he talks there about different groups of people and what they will receive. And what he's saying harkens back to Isaiah 61. Now Jesus has read Isaiah 61 previously when he entered the temple and he speaks about, he reads Isaiah 61 from the scrolls and he says, you know, this is now fulfilled in me. So let's have a read of Isaiah 61 and see how it, the Beatitudes mirror and, and dovetail with these, um, what Isaiah wrote. He says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. So each statement of the Beatitudes is a statement of who will be blessed, followed by 
the reason why they will be blessed. And why, you know, why will they be blessed? What will that blessing actually consist of? You know, it's blessed are those who? For they will, and then it tells you why they will be blessed. For they will is interesting, though, because does it relate to the now, or does it relate to the coming kingdom? Is it telling us, you know, blessed are those who whatever, for they will, it kind of points to the future. You know, your situation now may not actually be solved now, but in the future, you will have this blessing. So is it a promise or is it a risk for us where we, some, we might look at it and go, well, do I believe this? Do I trust this? Do I trust this man, Jesus, that actually this blessing is going to come to me? And what does blessed actually mean? Does it mean that I'll be happy? Yeah, I'll be happy in the future because of this? Or does it actually mean far more? You know, inner peace and joy from being right with God. It's not related to the here and now, but something far more than what is going on, what the circumstances of my here and now are. You know, it, it's why we can have joy regardless of the circumstance that we're going through. And again, if we think about last week or, or of other weeks, Paul expresses joy when he writes to the Philippians and yet he's in prison. How can you have joy whilst you're in prison? And yet Paul manages to do that. And that's because he has this inner peace. So he can be blessed. It doesn't relate. Our joy does not relate to our circumstances. It also is a proclamation that God is pleased with people. You know, in Matthew 23, Jesus lists a whole bunch of woes. Woe to the people who are this. Woe to the people who are that. That is the exact opposite of this, where Jesus is saying, blessed are the people who are. So here is a list of people that God is pleased with and God is looking after, whereas the woes are a list of people that God is displeased with. So we're going to look now at the first of those blessings. We're going to look at a few each week, but today we're just going to look at the first one, which is, as we know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we understand the concept of poverty, you know, and we usually as associate the lack of, you know, poor, poverty, as having a lack of something. You know, you don't have something and that makes you poor. You don't have money, you don't have possessions, and you're poor. But here, Jesus isn't just talking about financial or possession poverty. It's not about being given the opportunity to have things either. It's not about that. It's not about saying, you know, I'm going to solve this by giving you the opportunity to have things. That's not what Jesus says. You know, um, we looked at, at that type of poverty last week when we looked at justice and injustice. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. This goes further because here Jesus is talking about people who are poor in spirit. And it says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. So what does that actually mean? Well, that means the afflicted, the dispossessed people, the oppressed people, desperate people who feel powerless and without hope. You know, that is different to having no money, say. You know, this is about people who have that, that spirit in them that says, I am poor, I have nothing, I mean nothing to people. Physical poverty and spiritual po poverty often do feed on each other, 
But it is important to understand that here Jesus is talking about the spiritually poor, the people who feel that they are nobodies. Now, Jesus' message is not necessarily that their situation on earth is going to change, because it might not. But what it does say is that something far greater was waiting for them. And that thing was the kingdom of heaven. So does this mean you have to be afflicted to inherit the kingdom of heaven? Well, maybe not. Because he's talking about here the characteristics of somebody who is poor in spirit. And they tend to be humble. They tend to, you know, it's about repentance. You're feeling genuinely sorry for things. They tend to have no arrogance, no self-righteousness. They don't think they're more important than the person next door to them. They know that they're not self-sufficient. They know that they need to depend on Christ. They need to depend on Christ for their well-being, their survival. And they have no pretensions. Poor in spirit people are broken people. Some might be broken by situations, and some might be broken by understanding of what their situation actually is. So being poor in spirit is actually open to everybody. It's just that quite often, it's very much easier to see that somebody is broken in spirit or poor in spirit when they have nothing. Wealth or lack of wealth doesn't actually matter as to whether or not you're poor in spirit. Yes, it's your spirit that actually matters. You can be poor and angry. You can be rich and arrogant. Or you can be poor and have joy. And you can be rich and be humble. Both require a decision by the person involved. We can decide how we're going to act to our situation, how we're going to view our situation. Are we going to be poor in spirit, regardless of whether we are poor financially or not poor financially? Whether we have lots of possessions or no possessions? Are we going to be angry? Are we going to be arrogant? Or are we going to be humble and I still have that spirit of joy. Now this, en this answers the question of why works do not bring salvation as well. Because poor in spirit doesn't matter about your works. You know, you can be doing great works, but if you're not poor in spirit, what's, what's the thing? What's the point? Or you can be, have no works at all, but be poor in spirit. But this explains why grace is the important thing. Jesus has done all of the hard work to bring salvation to people. He's done it all. Our spirit needs to accept that. So we need a poor spirit. Poor in spirit, a humble, broken Reliant on Jesus' spirit, regardless of who, what, or where we are. And that is what enables us to accept the sacrifice that Jesus gave and understand that how that is and become reliant on Jesus. And the thing is, is it's not just about having that view, having that spirit, to bring salvation and to enable us to, to have inherit the kingdom. It's about having that spirit in everything that we do continually, wherever we are. You know, we need to apply that throughout our lives. Once we've made the decision to follow Christ, we still need to apply it. So, we're just going to pray. I'm going to pray for everybody watching this this morning and just pray that we can understand about being poor in spirit and what a joy it would be and what we can inherit once we understand that because we can inherit the kingdom of Christ 
because we understand how much we rely on Christ, what that means for us. So let's pray. Father, you said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom. And I just pray for people who are downtrodden, who feel downtrodden, that rather than feel angry about their situation, rather than want to rage against everything that there is, they can look to you, Christ, and understand that something far better is waiting for them in heaven. If they can grasp that you sacrificed your life on that cross to give them that better existence. We may not see the benefits of that immediately. We may not see the benefits of that whilst we are on this earth. But we have faith, Lord, that those benefits are there for us when we go to heaven. I pray for people who have lots, who have everything that they think they could ever want, that they can look to you and be humbled and realise that they may well have everything that this world can provide, but without you, they have nothing that they need spiritually and they have nothing that they need eternally. So I pray for everyone listening to this message today, Lord, whether they are rich, whether they are poor, that we can all be humble, look to you, understand your sacrifice, humble ourselves, confess our sins, repent of our sins, understand what sin means, and understand that we need to be poor in spirit, and that doesn't make us poor people but it makes us joyous inheritors of your kingdom. Amen. Thanks for listening. When I stand in the midst of a trial When I stand in the pouring rain When I go to the highest mountain there's a peace that is with me, I see you You're breaking through When I go through the flames of the fire There's a light shining brighter still When I go through the darkest valley There's a hope that is with me, I see you You're breaking through Chains being broken Blind eyes open Spirit come For
being with us today we pray that you have enjoyed it and uh, brought you a little closer to Jesus have a good week may the Lord bless you and keep you goodbye for now we are often told God loves you but what does that really mean that some impersonal force galaxies away may consider you from time to time or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it. There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you.